When I first learned about our summer sermon series, Everyday Justice, I wasn't the most enthusiastic about the idea. A six-week series on all of the ways our daily actions impact global warming and slave labor and so on sounded like kind of a bummer. <laughs> Not exactly what one would consider light-hearted summer series material. But Reverend Laura reassured me her upbeat enthusiasm for this project, well, after a while, it became infectious. She laid out for me the exciting interactive pieces that we're doing each week. For example, if you were here last week, you received your very own reusable metal drinking straw. And while you won't be getting something today, you will be given an opportunity to do more than just sit there and listen. But more about that later. You see, I was going to, I thought that this was going to be a six week guilt trip and all of the ways my daily habits are slowly destroying the world. And while I might sound like I'm being dramatic, some of these topics can get pretty heavy. But what Reverend Laura rightly pointed out, this isn't about be beating ourselves up for our bad choices. Really, that doesn't help anyone. It's about realizing how small daily tweaks can make a big impact over time. It's about finding ways to bring our actions in line with our beliefs as people of faith. I was once told humans overestimate what they can do in a short amount of time, and they underestimate what they can do over a long period of time. And I think that's true. But the main reason for my reluctance was an uncomfortable truth that I've discovered about myself. You see, there are some people in this world, when they learn how their actions are not in line with their beliefs or how they want to live their life, they just stop doing whatever that thing is, just like that. And I'm jealous of those people because I struggle with that a lot. I have some pretty lofty ideas of what my best life looks like, where my every purchase, every action, every bite of food that I eat reflects not only my personal beliefs, but also is the best action to take for the highest good of all those around me. I have this vague, general sense of the terrible conditions for people who slow our clothes in places like China, or the gut-wrenching treatment of animals in factory farms. There's the indentured servitude of migrants who pick our food. The fact that this planet continues to teeter on the brink of irreversible climate crisis. And that's not even to mention the mass shootings that took place last weekend and the state of our national conversation around guns. It makes me want to just shut it all out and eat a pizza. <laughs> like, like a whole pizza. At best, my relationship with food can be categorized as it's complicated. <laughs> and I share that with you because I think it's important for you to know that I do not come to this sermon topic with any degree of moral superiority, which can creep into our conversations about food very quickly. There are places where vegan is a four-letter word and other places where people who don't eat organic are looked down upon. But after taking my ethics class last fall in seminary, I realized that there was going to come a day when I would have to share from the pulpit what I've learned. I didn't think it was going to come this soon, but here we are. A recent survey showed that 75% of people believe they eat somewhat humanely raised meat, cheese, milk, etc. And maybe you're one of those people. You can do a quick mental scan and think about what you tend to gravitate towards in the grocery store, what types of places you like to eat out at. What percentage of that food would you consider to come from factory farms? And I should explain what I mean by factory farms. Instead of going into tons of horrific detail, you can Google that stuff if you'd like to know more. But in the simplest of terms, factory farms are the worst offenders in how they treat animals, the level of pollution they dump into their surrounding environments, and even the negative impacts on their local communities. So let's just leave it at that for right now. That's factory farms. 
And it turns out that 99% of all animals raised in the U.S. for dairy and for food, they're raised in factory farms. 99%. That's a tough pill to swallow. We all know places like fast food serve factory farm meat and cheese, or we know how to stay away from companies like Tyson Foods, who are notorious for their unethical animal practices. But what most people aren't aware of is the fact that over 90% of all meat, cheese, eggs in your local grocery store also come from factory farms, including places like Trader Joe's. And the packaging on our food is getting better and better about misleading people. For example, let's take cage-free eggs. Sounds great, right? Once you see those images in chickens and battery cages, it's pretty difficult to get out of your mind. So cage-free is definitely a step in the right direction. But now that cage-free is becoming the industry standard, we're beginning to see what cage-free really looks like. Giant warehouses filled with thousands of chickens who are trapped inside with giant fans because the level of ammonia, ammonia is so, it's, it's real bad, okay? It's just, you can, it's not great, okay? You can trust me on that. Um, and range, free range, that turns out that they're still in those warehouses, but there's this like tiny door with this like access to a small cement patio. Um, great, right? And take a company like Mary's Organic Chicken. If you go to their website, you see chickens who live their entire lives outdoors. They're like literally frolicking in the grass on their website. I went and I looked. But what's misleading is only one of their farms are designed that way. The rest of them are those warehouses with those cement patios. The point is even those who are looking like they're doing the right thing can hide behind labeling and good marketing. Even the label humanely raised isn't actually regulated to mean anything industry-wide. So if you're looking for the most ethical source of meat, what can you do? I mean, meat is delicious. Okay, I said it, right? <laughs> it's great. And so are those Impossible Burgers, by the way. If you haven't tried them, I cannot stop talking about them. <laughs> ask me, ask Kelly, anytime I will talk to you all about those Impossible Burgers. But your best chance at eating meat and dairy from ethically treated animals is to look for the label pasture raised. Not pasteurized, that's like a whole different thing, but pasture raised. That means weather permitting that they spend their days outside, free to roam, and then sleep indoors. And I'm gonna warn you because Kelly and I tried this in a grocery store, even the good ones, it's hard to find meat and dairy that's pasture raised. Oftentimes, we'll only find one brand or one type, but they're there if you hunt for them. And I learned about all this in my class. When I learned about all this in my class, I realized how almost all meat and cheese I ate in restaurants, even the fancy ones, at neighborhood barbecues. Did I mention Trader Joe's? Still sad about that. They all came from factory farms, and I was sick about it. I mean, I put cheese on everything. It's like my major food group. And so for Lent this year, I tried to only eat meat and dairy from ethical sources. This meant that when I ate out, I had to basically eat vegan. And I would love to tell you that it was this magical experience that I, you know, it was hard, but I learned some life lessons, and I came out on the other side a better person. <laughs> but I didn't even last a month. That's true, true story. Um, but I'm going to try again next Lent. And I did pick up some habits that I've been able to keep to this day, like purchasing pasture-raised cheese and occasionally eating vegetarian or vegan for a meal or a day. But this is easy for me to say as someone who lives well above the poverty line. There are others who aren't as fortunate, who have to work multiple jobs just to afford a place to live, and with all the stress and lack of resources that comes along with living around the poverty line, many of them feel like fast food and cheap meat is their only option. In fact, here in LA, we have several areas known as food deserts, where people don't have access to fresh food, only liquor stores and fast food chains. But there's one organization that's trying to combat this, which you may or may not have heard of. It's called Every Table. They discovered that in South LA, life expectancy was 10 years lower 
than their more affluent neighbors. And they struggled with health conditions such as diabetes and obesity in greater numbers. So they began to talk to people in these neighborhoods and found out that it wasn't enough to just provide them with opportunities to purchase fresh fruit and vegetables. Faced with this challenge, they hatched a genius plan to create several grab-and-go food locations where people could get already prepared meals that were healthy, delicious, and cheap. Like, really cheap. If they were going to be serious about competing with fast food in Compton and Watts, they needed to serve meals that only cost $5. To help make this possible, some of their locations were placed in more affluent neighborhoods, like the one near here in downtown LA, and they would charge a whopping $8 for the same meal. That small price difference would allow them to be successful in those lower income areas. And by the way, there's a map in, of all their locations in your bulletin today. You will see all the information for each of them, um, and I'm hoping that you're going to check them out. The simple act of eating a meal at every table here in downtown will actually help support their business and allow them to continue their work in places like Watts. And I'm talking good food here. We should have included a picture of the food <laughs> with the, along with the map because they have things like Mediterranean grain bowls or their salmon or Thai noodle bowl. They're not joking around. They even have vegan and vegetarian options. So now you might have heard of Every Table because the founder, Sam Polk, actually came here to First Church when they first opened back in 2016. In fact, he handed out coupons to everyone to go try it for free. So I suppose that was like your free takeaway. But today we're going to ask you to give something instead. One of the cool features of this restaurant is there's a community board with post-it notes where individuals in need can come in, grab one of those post-it notes, and turn it in for a free meal. So we're going to ask you to sponsor a meal. Or maybe you can sponsor more than one meal. Let's be real, it's $6. You probably can afford more than one meal. Our justice and community outreach team will be at a table during coffee hour today, and they will help you purchase these vouchers. You can even write messages on them. But don't let your fear of not knowing what to say to write keep you from buying one of these vouchers. Card, cash, whatever works best for you, they will take it all. So please stop by that table before you leave today. In an ideal world, we'll have a line form because so many people are stepping forward to purchase meals. So please stick around, grab a cup of coffee, and be patient so we can purchase as many meals as possible. I want to leave you with this cheesy, overshared story that you've probably already heard before. It's been so overshared that it ranks up there with the footprints in the sand poem where Jesus carries the people. But I first heard this story as a child, and it had a deep impact on me. And I think it's a good reminder for all of us. So even if you've heard this once or twice or ten times, I invite you to put yourself in the place of listening as if it were the first time. There was an old man who was walking down along the shore. And he could see a young woman far up ahead was doing something along the shoreline. As he got closer, he noticed she was doing the same action over and over again. She would bend down and pick up a starfish and chuck it back into the ocean. And as he got closer, he couldn't help himself. He just blurted out, what are you doing? Then she said, the tide has gone out. And so all these starfish are stranded. And if I don't pick them up and throw them back into the ocean, they will die. He said, there are hundreds of starfish here, and there must be like miles and miles of beaches all over the world where starfish are, uh, are stranded. How could you possibly make a difference? And so she bent down, and she picked up the starfish. She threw it out into the ocean. And she said, I made a difference for that one. Every action, no matter how small, over time or combined with others, can make a real impact. And so I invite you this morning to think about 
one small change that you can take, whether it's one meatless meal a week or just paying more attention next time you're at the grocery store, together, with God's help, we can make a difference for more than just one. Amen.